we just have to walk through the door as our authentic selves. Some people are going to like us. Some people are going to love us. Mm -hmm. But every day we have to, you know, work in, in our work through our authentic and true selves. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Houston Ensemble podcast. We have a wonderful episode today. We are with Tammy Wallace, the CEO, president, and more of the Houston LGBTQ plus Chamber of Commerce. Now, Tammy, I want to make sure I said all that properly. You got it. I, uh, I'm also one of the co-founders. So Co-founder yeah. too. That's yeah. right. I was reading about that last night mm-hmm. and... Uh, usually when we start a podcast, we kind of, you know, I'll give a little introduction just to Mm -hmm. say who you are, but I would really love for you to tell people who don't know about the chamber, uh, tell them what it is, maybe a little backstory on it, how you wanted to get it started. And then we'll go from there. Okay. Well, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to, to join you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to always share more about the chamber and the work that we're doing. Um, so the Greater Houston LGBTQ plus Chamber of Commerce was founded in 2016. And um, we launched the chamber because we didn't see a, you know, a seat or nor did we have a voice at the table when it comes to think of anything around economic development, uh, business in this city. So the community, the LGBTQ plus community was lar- largely sought out after as a, an activist group, which I often say we are. And many times we're the loudest voice in the room because we've had to be, um, or a voter base. You know, electeds come, they it's a coveted voting block. We want your support. But no one was looking through this lens of business. It is widely known that the tobacco and diet industries lobby governments with scientific propaganda for years until proven guilty in court. The artificial treatment of our water is the next corporate deception. For example, virtually every nation in Europe has rejected the use of artificial fluoride. International studies since the 40s have repeatedly shown that endocrine and neurological effects increase after repeated consumption, even at the levels accepted by U.S. government. Epic Water Filters is the most thorough industry-grade filtration system that Houston ensemble has ever used. They reduce heavy metals upwards of 99.5% such as lead and mercury, bacteria like E. coli, and poisons like chromium, nitrate, and fluoride. Join us in our journey to living a toxin-free life and get your epic water filter using discount code Houston Ensemble lowercase one word. That's Houston Ensemble lowercase one word for 20% off your epic water filter. And so that's what we wanted to do was not only create an organization that was there to support uh, LGBTQ plus and allied owned businesses, but to make sure that we're driving economic opportunity for these businesses day in and day out. And um, like any chamber, I mean, we host a number of events, networking, uh, programming. We just got through with a great series with Google, Grow with Google, Small Business Boot Camp. But we also connect professionals and LGBTQ plus um, employee resource group leaders corporate partners. We partner with, you know, the Houston Rockets as an example on Pride Night. So Mm -hmm. um, we're doing a lot when it comes to supporting the community, uh, including our upcoming uh, Chamber Holiday Food Drive to support LGBTQ plus seniors. That's awesome. And what did you do before you started this? Because you started this in 2016. Yes. So what were you kind of doing business-wise before then? So I spent about 14 years in financial services. So think Bank of America, Mellon Bank, the big, you know, the the, the big financial services banks. Um, and, and that was great. It really set me on a path to what I do today in terms of, you know, skills and, and opportunity and education. Um, fast forward, though, uh, to, to 2015, I had started my own business in 2012 and in 2015, I actually read a Houston Chronicle article about the um, LGBTBE or Business Enterprise Certification. Mm-hmm. And it was a certification, and you may have heard of this, like minority women business owned certifications. And, I, and it's if you're 51% or more LGBTQ owned, and I was like, wow, I didn't know that existed. That was part, the certification article was focused on 
the Super Bowl that we were going to be getting in 2017. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about how the NFL had rolled out their Business Connect program uh, a number of years ago. And for the first time in 2016, would be in, would be including LGBTQ plus owned businesses as part of that opportunity. And so that's what really, first of all, was like an LGBTQ plus chamber. Wow. Did my research, found out there's one in Austin, right. San Antonio, and North Texas. So you can imagine, I was like, uh, we need one here. I remember reading that part. Yes. Yeah. And so we, um, and, and our other co-founder, Gary Wood, he had a similar, similar path that took us both to the national LGBT Chamber of Commerce, of which we're an affiliate. And um, they both, you know, when we both went there, they actually connected us. We knew each other. We've known each other for a very long time in the community. But um, they said, well, you know, we've got two inquiries here. And it was like, well, let's get connected. And he and I said, we've got to start an organization. We literally launched the Chamber, I kid you not, in less than 90 days. Wow. Yeah. Because the Super Bowl was coming, because there was opportunities, um, we wanted to get our businesses connected. We wanted to, in order to get them connected, we needed to get them certified. So we needed it as much runway as we could get before the 2017 Super Bowl, because all the opportunities really would be leading up to. And then as we know, you know, the Super Bowl typically happens in late January or, or early February. Right. So, uh, so yeah. And um, we launched it pretty fast with the help of our colleagues at the North Texas LGBT Chamber of Commerce. What does that look like? What is the process for starting an organization like that from the first step? Like first phone call, what are, what are we doing? Yeah, you know, Gary and I had coffee. That's such a great question. Gary and I had coffee, and I'll tell you, one of my comments to him was this, is if we want to start an organization that's going to be networking and coffees and, you know, a luncheon every once in a while, that's all great. Because, you know, again, we didn't have a chamber here, an LGBTQ chamber. But... I said, if we want to start an organization, we're going to do impact work. We're going to lift the bar and move the bar, right, continually for the LGBTQ plus community that I'm in. So Gary wholeheartedly agreed. And that looked like us sitting down, figuring out who we needed around the table to get this going. We created a founding leadership council and uh, working with the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce to help get this going and then working with the North Texas LGBT Chamber of Commerce, who actually back-ended until we could get, they, they put a website, uh, a landing page up for us off their site and help take memberships until we could get all of our back end set up. So it was visioning, sitting, sitting around figuring out, you know, okay, which, which business owners are likely to join right away so we could at least start. And in the first year, I mean, we had almost 100 members at that point. So, so I might, because I want to understand, also I want people watching to mm -hmm. understand <laughs> It's a two-part. We represent the audience as well. Uh, so I'm sorry if this sounds uneducated when I ask this, but what does it exactly mean to be a chamber? This word chamber, what is, what is the definition of that? So traditionally, chambers, um, chambers have been around since the 1950s. And a lot of times what would happen is leaders in, in towns – Mm -hmm. Towns, and I say towns because even Houston at one point used to be a town, right? Mm -hmm. um, would bring together businesses to to connect, to network, to support the community, right? To bring visibility to the city. In some cases, some chambers they try to attract more tourism, right, to their to their city. Mm -hmm. In some cases, chambers um, literally drive programming and events. Sometimes they'll run the visitor center. Uh, we obviously don't do that here. We're specifically focused, and we're we're considered a uh, part of the diverse chamber group. So there's a lot of diverse chambers in Houston. Think the uh, Greater Houston Black Chamber, the the Houston Hispanic Chamber, the Indo American, the Asian Chamber, and the list goes on and on. So, and these chambers specifically are working to bring together uh, businesses to create connection, support, networking, and ultimately help these businesses grow and thrive. Mm -hmm. So, in, in the case of diverse chambers, specifically for, you know, those different groups, like for us, it's LGBTQ+, but I have to say, we have about a third of our members that are allied-owned businesses. They don't identify as LGBTQ+, and it's not required, right? What does that mean, allied-owned? Allied means that you're an ally of the LGBTQ+, community. So, um, if you don't identify as LGBTQ+, yourself but you're very supportive of the community. Uh, we typically will refer to you as LGBTQ plus allies. Mm -hmm. 
So somebody that, for example, is an elected official, you might have someone that actually identifies as LGBTQ+, and then an elected official who's not, you know, gay, um, but supports the community, and that would be an ally. That was a question that I was going to ask you, so I'm glad Mm -hmm. you brought that up, because I was curious, is it, and I would actually understand if it was only for LGBTQ Mm -hmm. people, but my question was going to be, is it exclusive to them. And so it's not. It's absolutely not. And you know why? I mean, part of that is, one, we need to be an inclusive chamber, and that includes our allies. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of the day, our members are trying to do business. And whether you're an LGBTQ plus owned business or you're an allied owned business, business is business, right? (laughs) And so we want to give them as much opportunity as possible to network and connect and, and, you know, um, share business, product, service, all that. But um, we also want to create connection between, you know, maybe allies, different communities, some of those other diverse chambers I mentioned. We've done collaboration events with them um, because when we can break down these walls, right, then we can help build a bridge of understanding, whether it's between communities, between our members themselves. It's really, really important that we help be a catalyst for that type of connection And so um, it would just be contradictory if we had a chamber and said, oh, by the way, you have to be LGBTQ plus. Um, Mm -hmm. If any, if people support the community, uh, they want to, you know, give back. I think the chamber is a great way to do that. Honestly, I mean, a lot of our members, their allied members or, you know, regular LGBTQ owned businesses are smart because this is a great opportunity to do business. Mm -hmm. But a lot of our allies come to us and they say, Look, I'm a business owner, and yes, I want to do, you know, promote my business and all that, but I support the community, and I want to, this is a great way I think can support, can I join? And it's like, yes, absolutely, you can. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense for all business people, because does this apply to every chamber where, like, the black chamber, for example, do you have to be black to be a part of that? No, no. Okay, so it's kind of just a very good networking sort of thing. Um, just with certain labels to empower certain groups. Yeah, and I would say uh, less labels and more about you know we want to do business with. That's probably uh, a bad word. Well, and it, it, but it you know it's it's a used word, right? You commonly hear that, but we want to do business who's you know where your values align with mine, mm-hmm. right? If I'm going to have a plumber in my house, I want to know that I can say my wife, right? I can be comfortable. I don't have to hide who I am, um, you know, or if I'm going to have an accountant and share all of my paperwork and all right. that, right? Those, those types of engagements matters. And it really, really matters when, you know, you're having to, to engage different businesses to provide service, services for you on a personal or even, you know, for your business, so it's really, really important to um, for a lot of people in the community and our allies, they say, look, I want to do business with people where our values align. Mm-hmm. And that's what we do. If you go to our website, HoustonLGBTChamber.com, you can see our public directory of all of our members. And those are members that are committed to supporting our mission. They're invested in the chamber and their businesses are, you know, working and they're inclusive, what we like to call LGBTQ plus inclusive businesses committed to supporting the community. I really like that. I wanted to ask you another thing, uh, more a little more personal. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us kind of your backstory about your, your experience? You're married to a woman. Yes. Um, I understand that, by the way, my mom is also married to a yeah. woman. Their anniversary actually was yesterday. Oh, wonderful. Six years or something. Congratulations. They got, they got yeah. married right when the law passed. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they were together before that. But, uh, you know, it's a big milestone for them. I had a dad for a while. Mm-hmm. So there was a switch. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of familiar with this world to an extent. And mm-hmm. I would love to know a little bit about your story. Yeah, so um, I I actually moved to Houston in 1986, so I've been here. I've lived longer in Houston than I did. I'm, I'm from Mississippi. I was born in Memphis, oh, cool. raised right across the state line. And I actually came to Houston to go to Bible school because mm. I thought, you know, I was going to be very involved in, in reli- organized religion. And, um, you know, let's just say that didn't work out. Mm-hmm. But um, 
but here I am, right? I didn't come out until I was 25, though. And a lot of that was growing up my whole adult, uh, my whole young life. I heard, you know, uh, from the pulpit, Mm -hmm. literally every Sunday, homosexuals were going to hell, you know, the terminology at the time. Uh, that I was going to go straight to hell. And, you know, I'm trying to, as a as a young person, reconcile this in my life, right? <coughs> um, reconcile who I am. I'm going to have to stop. I'm sorry if the incense, <laughs> the incense got me. <coughs> Ooh, the incense did get me. I just wanted it to smell so nice for you. It's all good. <laughs> that helps. You want me to pick up where I was? Yeah, that's great. Um, so... Um, <coughs> oh goodness sorry um so as a young person you know hearing that every day from the pulpit um it, it was you know it was hurtful i and i you have to understand i didn't even understand who i was at the time i didn't mm. identify as a lesbian which i do today um i didn't understand that that part of myself i just knew that i was very much more attracted to women mm-hmm. um and so um you know, when you when you when you're raised in a religion that tells you this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. Even you know a fundamentalist religion that told me other religions were bad. Um, you know, it 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 creates this challenge for you, particularly as a young person, to kind of reconcile and find out who you are. Yeah. So I stayed. You know, uh, I I hid in the closet. I mean, as as a lot of people do, but not only. For me, Heidi, I didn't even come to terms to uh, who I was until I was about 24, 25, because I had to slowly start in my early 20s, extrapolate myself from the church Mm -hmm. and then realize and do therapy and realize that I'm okay just as I am. Mm -hmm. This is who God made me. This Mm -hmm. is how I was born. And um, so, you know, that took, that was a journey as it is for a lot of people. It, and, and I had to go through, you know, walk through some doors, and uh, it really began to accept myself and say that this is okay. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is exactly who I am, who I'm meant to be. And, um, and, you know, I wouldn't change a thing. People have asked me that before. Uh, sometimes I would change the struggle. Uh, it's unfortunate that there's so much struggle. I absolutely would change that. But who I am, the struggles I've been through, the challenges – from, you know, coming out to moving here when I was 17, all of that makes me, you know, uh, who I am today. And it's certainly put me on the path to the work that I do today. And I've been involved in the LGBTQ plus community in Houston for over two decades. And it's very much my passion to help raise and lift up the community and make sure that we have, you know, economic opportunity, equity across the board, whether it comes to laws, you know, legislation, mm-hmm. um, or even at the ballot box. Does your organization have any work with um, Houston Arts Alliance by any chance? We don't work with the Arts Alliance, but we do have an Arts Plus Business Initiative. So we very much recognize, um, first of all, the arts. You know, we have a lot of LGBTQ plus people in the community that are involved in, in the arts as artists or, you know, uh, or other types of roles. And we know that's been the case for, uh, you know, since the are really since the inception of the arts. Um, But we also see the business piece of this. I mean, the arts are key to our city. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, you guys, your band, music is such a vibrant part of our city. You know, the, all, all the arts and culture that make up Houston. It's one of the things that we recognize uh, makes good business sense because we attract more tourism here because we attract more people to live here when they mm-hmm. see mm-hmm. arts and culture, right? So for us, um, we have a host of art, what we call arts plus business members. The Alley Theater is a great example. The Houston Symphony mm-hmm. just joined us. The 1940 Air Terminal Museum is one of our members. And we're going to be doing an event out there on September the 17th. Wow. We're literally going to be right on the runway of Hobby Airport. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the national, here's a great one most people don't even know about, the National Museum of Funeral History. Funeral History. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal museum that's out in North mm-hmm. Houston. Mm-hmm. And literally, they have uh, Genevieve Keeney as the uh, president and CEO. She has done remarkable work with the museum. Am I going to pass that on 45? Yes, you are. <laughs> so I've definitely passed by. Yes. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so. you know, th- uh, they have everything from the presidential exhibit. So think about when a president dies, mm-hmm. there's a whole 
process, right? Right. And then what happens to all those things? For example, mm-hmm. the casket or – and they have – it's huge. What they Plus do with and, the flag and stuff. There you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And just just the little, the protocol that's requ- required. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's a gem. These are these are just um, amazing gems in that's our really city. Cool. Yeah. You, you know, I have grown to love Houston. I'm yeah. from Cincinnati, Ohio. I didn't necessarily love Houston right when I got here because yep. I had to get very acclimated. I had to figure out where everything was. It's kind of pockety. Same here. Um, but I've grown to love it. I've gone to so many other places, so many other cities. I was just in New York a couple of days ago, and I still love it here. New yep. York was cool too. But you said something that I had a a gripe with yesterday, Arm, mm-hmm. Armin and I did. Houston is an amazing culture and arts hub and music so many amazing musicians have mm-hmm. come out of here so yesterday you know we didn't have our mm-hmm. mercantile coffee shop slash avant garden because of labor day mm-hmm. which is fine so we were saying why don't we go down to discovery green park area downtown mm-hmm. where we've performed on stage and yeah we've played on discovery yep. green and all those places the grove that restaurant in the park all sorts of places we said, let's get the band together, set up, just play some songs for people, you know, yeah. donate a little music. Maybe they'll make a donation to us. Mm-hmm. But we learned that busking is illegal in the city of Houston, except for in parts of the theater district. And the manager of the park said, I'll turn a blind eye. You guys can play, mm-hmm. but just put the tip jar away. Yeah. And... I really appreciate that he let us play. No doubt about yeah. that. But I was like, man, we are an arts hub. We're a music hub. We are. And I get that there's private property stuff. But I know for a fact, when you go to New Orleans or you go to New York, there is a charm to walking around and seeing all mm-hmm. sorts of people playing music. And also, we're playing good music. Yep. It's not going to be bad. Uh, so... I have to go have a talk with Mayor Turner now. <laughs> well, and and you know this is exactly where advocacy starts, right? Right. Mm-hmm. You you see something that happens happens to you personally, you're like, wait a minute. You find out the law is written this way or mm-hmm. a city ordinance, and you're like, well, why is this the case? Mm-hmm. And then it takes citizens to bring this to the attention of elected leaders and say. Well, this this just doesn't work, mm-hmm. and maybe it worked. Let's just say the ordinance is ten years ago. I don't know, mm-hmm. right? Maybe it worked ten years ago, but mm-hmm. for the city that we are today, does it does it work? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. one of the best ways to start is to reach out to your your council person. That's what I was thinking yep. about, and you know, I'm not actually overly mad or anything about right. this, but learning that yesterday was kind of eye opening <laughs> to me because I thought. This city that I put up on a pedestal, and mm-hmm. this is a very simple issue, but you know, I want people to come here and see what it has to offer. Yeah. And you know, musicians aren't gonna necessarily go out for free when we have to work yeah. all the time. So it's nice to get some tips. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was thinking, okay, well, maybe we'll talk to the city council, see what we can do. Cause we're trying yeah. to be with our podcast, with the bands that mm-hmm. we play in everywhere in town and all that kind of stuff. We want to want to make a mark on the city and unite yeah. unite with everybody too. Yeah. So, other than that, we have a great time. We played great music yesterday for an hour. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, and that, you know, that's that's the beauty of of Houston, right? You just mm-hmm. but we need to clearly let, you know, let musicians be able to expand more. I, your your point about you said New I think New Orleans and New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that see that's such a good reference point. First of all, you think, well, maybe that is a good ordinance. But then you think, I've been to New Orleans, I've been to New York, and you're right. It's part of the vibe. It feels yeah, good, right. right? And so, um, so there's always a good opportunity to reevaluate and say, should we be doing things differently? What do you think about this? Yeah. You know, for me, I think about an ordinance like that a little bit more. Like I think about the micro uh, aspects of the consequences of an mm-hmm. ordinance like that on a very local level, and then mm-hmm. I think more macro and i mm-hmm. think okay so cities will begin to now have ordinances for no performances on the streets yeah so now what is happening is the line of how much people are able to use public spaces in general around mm-hmm. the city is is shrinking right 
So then what do you have? Do you have a city of people or do you have a city of residents? Right. You know, and and I rather not be in a city of residents. That's right. like not a homey vibe. Right. Right. Yep. I think. Yeah, because they were really getting into yesterday what was private property and mm-hmm. what was not. Mm-hmm. And it was two feet of the sidewalk that was public property. And the park had been acquired by a nonprofit and the mm-hmm. convention had been acquired by a nonprofit. And then that street, I think it's Avenidas, yeah. Las Americas, yeah. that street connecting them. That is also private property technically. Mm-hmm. And I, of course, I get that you have to be able to do certain things. But I was like, man, okay. There's a lot of, a lot of private mm-hmm. property here. Or at least, you know. Like Armin was just saying, it'd be nice to really make sure that everybody had a say or at least got what we pay for. Yeah. To well, an and part of it, just inquiring with your council member and just asking, what's the background on this? Why did it get passed? What, mm-hmm. you know, what does it look like? And, you know, going to other cities too and seeing what do their ordinances look like? Right. How have they been able to adapt, right? To, Feed the need, right, for what the community wants to hear, but also tourism, et cetera, right? And to create that balance if it's uh, if it's a balance of issues with noise, for example. Other mm-hmm. cities have figured this out somewhere along the way. Mm-hmm. So um, Houston being the fourth largest city, I'm pretty certain we could we could figure this out, right, yeah. with the right people around the table and the will, the will to to make mm-hmm. make some adjustments or some changes. How much red tape do you go through, if mm. if at all? Like, let's say you have a new advocacy for the chamber. You need some approval from the city. Yeah. How, is that smooth? Is that bumpy? Well, you know, it, it's, it's... I wouldn't say it's either smooth or bumpy. Mm. It's um, we try to be involved all year long, like having our elected officials at our events so we can create relationships with them, right? They know who the chamber is what our priorities are, what our members are looking like. And we're also advocating in Austin during the state legislature, working with the other LGBTQ chambers across the state. So um, the the important thing is to be visible, right? To, mm-hmm. to be engaging, be visible, so they know who you are. So when requests come through, it's like, oh, yeah, the chamber. Okay, let's, mm-hmm. see, let's see what they want or what they need. Um, to Mayor Turner's credit, um, we worked with him. It took a little while. You know, he's had to deal with a lot, a pandemic, and let's see, Hurricane Harvey and a Texas freeze. And um, But we worked when we started the chamber to get LGBTQ-owned businesses recognized in City of Houston contracting and procurement, and he signed an executive order mm-hmm. to do that in uh, 2021. Is that the thing on your website? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I read that. So, and we're working, you know, with other governmental and quasi-governmental entities to make sure that our businesses are are represented and uh, have have similar opportunities. This gets back to the economic opportunity piece. Mm. So, is there um, so regarding what you're saying about the executive order that he signed? Mm-hmm. Are there examples of these businesses not being included or being uh, shorted? For lack of a better well, term. so what happens with LGBTQ plus business owners for a lot of, um, so a lot of times we don't come out professionally as far as business owners, right? right? Maybe we're out personally, but we don't put on our website maybe that we're LGBTQ owned. We don't promote, we don't join the chamber because we're scared of losing business of clients, of customers, right? Mm. Um, what that means is when we walk through certain spaces, Um, we don't bring our full and authentic selves. So sometimes, depending on, even as the chamber leader, I'll walk through and I have to think about, am I going to say my wife? What, you know, what? Now, Mm. it's less so for me running an LGBTQ plus owned business. But if you're an LGBTQ plus entrepreneur, um, somebody says, oh, you know, what'd you do this weekend? Well, my husband and I are my spouse, right? right? There's a whole difference. And for straight people, my husband or my wife is just, you don't even think about it. Right. We have to think about and vet our words every time we walk through a door, mm-hmm. depending on, you know, depending on the situation that we're in. That's one thing that the chamber does. It doesn't matter. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. We, we, you know, we appreciate you for who you are. Just come in, network, connect, do business with each other. Mm-hmm. None of that other stuff matters. Mm-hmm. Right. And that means they can bring their full and authentic selves um, to 
to the chamber. But that, you know, when business owners can do that, it's just like anybody, if you're in the workplace, if you're an employee, when you can bring your full and authentic self to the workplace, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, I understand that even a little bit. I'm heterosexual, so Mm -hmm. it doesn't apply to myself personally, but I understand that from saying, do I, depending on where I am, do I say mom's or mom? Yep. Because sometimes I play at a church yep. on Sundays and it's, you know, it's, they don't say anything like that, mm-hmm. anything bad. But, you know, there are a lot of older people there who are very, yep. I mean, even when I say I don't necessarily eat meat, I might mm-hmm. get a funny look. Yeah. Uh, Cause they'll be like, you eat ham, you eat all that. And I'm like, oh, I want you to like me. Yeah. Uh, but in general, what I've learned is I'm just like, ah, I'll just say whatever. We'll go with it. But it's different for me because it's one removed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's what we call covering, right? Yeah. And, you know, employees do it in the workplace. You, we do it, you know, LGBTQ plus people do it just in in daily life. <clears throat> that example, I mentioned of a plumber or electrician or somebody in, in my house in the past. I mean, there's a time when I, when I would say the other person in the house instead of my wife. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. You know, because I don't know, this person's in my house. <laughs> mm. Are they going to react to this? What does that look like? I uh, think, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Well, I was just going to say, I, you know, uh, a number of years ago, I uh, had to call in uh, to set up an appointment with a doctor. Uh, I was having something they thought maybe going on with the eye. And they did the, you know, the pre-questionnaire when I called in. You know, what's your name? Mm-hmm. I mean, last name, your address, all that good stuff. Are you married? <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Ready for this? What's your husband's name? Oh, just straight to it. Yep. That's and funny. The, the proper question is, what's your spouse's name? Right. right. But in that moment, when she said, what's your husband's name? I basically had two choices. Hang up the phone. And this was a serious, at the time we thought, I situation. Mm-hmm. Hang up the phone or out myself. So I had to out myself. That's what I chose to do and say, well, my husband is my wife, mm-hmm. and her name is Mercedes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was, those are the real life types of situations that, that we have to deal with. Um, and sometimes it, it gets down to, you know, in this case, it was my health. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Has, has, and I don't want anything to be too personal, so stop mm-hmm. me if it is, but has being uh, a lesbian affected you negatively? in your recent life? Like, did did a negative effect happen from that doctor's fill-out form? Was there a repercussion or an example around that? There wasn't a negative repercussion with that. Uh, sometimes you're left wondering, depending on situations, if they know that you're LGBTQ+, plus, sure. would they have treated me that way? Would have the, the outcome have been the same? Mm-hmm. Uh, a number of years ago, when I started my business, um, I had, you know, had someone call in and they wanted to work with me on a project and they were very excited. And um, it was a church at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, then when I called back and sent them the information and all this, you know, I I realized what had happened. And it was because, you know, I was part of the LGBTQ plus community and they didn't want to work with me. And, you know, when I first started my business, I had two different bios. One was my you know, regular bio. The other mm-hmm. was my gay bio, mm-hmm. um, depending on the context. And it, it was that that specific situation that I decided, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore. Like you, I mean, yeah. I'm like, I'm I'm I am who I am. So if this is a vetting tool and you decide you don't want to work with me in my company, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then ultimately, that's a good thing. But you know, for for some uh, for some of our one of our members, he wrote a, a book on LGBTQ plus inclusive healthcare. Opened up a second location in Pearland. Lady walks in, sees the book, and it's clearly got you know rain. It's got him painted in a rainbow on the front of it. It's very cool. He, uh, he does rehabilitation, and the um, the person just said, "Oh, this is y'all support." Uh, you know whatever she said. I don't know exactly how she phrased it, and I'm not going to do business here. And he said, "Good luck." on your health care journey and you know yeah so um but those are real life situations that people have to deal with i think that there are even there's so many of these things because even in a simple way a very 
minutia way. Mm-hmm. I get worried about having earrings mm-hmm. sometimes. Yep. I work at a really, I teach at a really expensive high-end high school mm-hmm. here in town. Mm-hmm. And when I went in for my interview, I shaved. I took out all my earrings except for yep. the long one. I was like, oh, man, probably not going to happen. But it worked. Um, and I feel like what I've learned, obviously, it's different in every scenario. But one thing that I feel is that if you present yourself as a good person or you're, you know, you're professional, charismatic, something along mm-hmm. these lines, a lot of people, not all, but a lot of people can maybe see past any sort of surface level thing. Yeah. Now, again, this does not apply to everybody. And I especially think it's not more likely to apply at a church where you said yeah. that you applied to, but it's like with a church, you know, that's a very fundamental ideology just built into that. Right. You know what I often say about what, with that, it creates a conflict for people. Right. And mm-hmm. and this has happened to me. It's like they don't they disagree, you know, with that I'm you know, that I identify as LGBTQ plus. Then they meet me and they're like, Well, she's really nice. She's right. this, she you know, she treated me so well. She did this, she did you know, it creates a conflict for people. And and when I have those conversations, I'm like, Yeah, because this is just who I am. Mm-hmm. Right. And so uh, I think that that conflict for people causes them in, in some cases, except for, you know, very ideological situations, mm-hmm. right, like churches, really causes them to uh, take a step back and go, hmm, why am I, why am I thinking this way just because he's got earrings, mm-hmm. right? right? Yep. And um, we saw this with the marriage equality, you know, fight leading up to 2015 uh, with the Supreme Court decision when people in our community started to tell their stories and just be who they were you know, or who they are and, and really be authentic and engaging. People were like, well, you know what? This is my daughter. This is my son. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Or this is my neighbor or this is my, you know, neighbor's child. And, you know, that's where I think we can really break down those, those walls. But first of all, we have to, we have to engage. And that's what I try to do is just be as authentic as I possibly can. Um, whether I'm e- even, I, I worked in the state legislature a number of years ago and dealing with who I knew were anti-LGBTQ plus, you know, legislators, um, trying to engage in a way that um, at least I was being authentic mm-hmm. and, um, you know, create, creating space for conversation, not necessarily with the legislator, but with their staffers. And that was a very positive experience. Mm. Well, can you please remind me what you were doing right before the chamber uh, endeavor? So, um, so I mentioned I spent 14 years in financial services, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, just to give you a little timeline there. Um, and uh, I got laid off. I was uh, at Bank of America at mm-hmm. the time, got laid off, got, went to one of their uh, companies that had gotten outsourced, uh, who I had worked for the department when I was with the bank. My old boss said, oh, come work for me, you know. So I went over there with her. Well, within two years, we were shutting down the operation site. I was getting laid off again. And Mm -hmm. at that point, you know, I just did that. What do I want to do when I grow up? That's actually how I got involved with the LGBTQ plus community in politics. Mm -hmm. Um, Started volunteering on some campaigns. Uh, Anise Parker's campaign is uh, one prime example. Uh, Got involved with uh, the LGBTQ plus political caucus at the time, and what was called then the Lesbian and Gay Rights Lobby of Texas. It's now Equality Texas. So that set me on this path to getting engaged with the community and, and starting to find my passion around, you know, equality and equity for our community. Um, then through that work, we founded an organization called the Houston Rights Equal Rights Alliance and did a lot of voter identification work, building a database of voters that would support the community. Mm. Um and from there, I met Ellen Cohen, who you may remember her name. She was the uh, she was mayor pro tem for the city of Houston for a number of years. But before that, she actually was a state legislator. So I was her chief of staff when she was in the state wow. legislature. And um, 
So I worked with her for a number of years when she decided she was going to run for city. Um, I, my passion, I know my passions and I know where they're not and garbage and potholes and all that. Mm-hmm. Not mine. Yeah. Um, so she gave me her blessing. I went to work for Kip Public Charter Schools okay, at the time yeah. to, to be their chief growth officer. Um, and then in 2011, uh, the state legislature cut $5.4 billion from education that year, that session. Really? And um, so I got caught up in another layoff with a lot of other folks from Kip. And it was at that point I just said, you know, I'm going to start my own business. So I did start my own business um, working, um, you know, with um, I've done community development projects. I've worked on uh, city contracts, you know, community engagement, governmental relations, a lot of different things. Um, But then, you know, having my own business is what caught my attention with the certification and led me to do the work for the chamber, which I pretty much do full time now. I'm just curious Um, if I wanted to start a chamber. Yeah. (laughs) What does that, you mentioned talking to the city, Mm -hmm. communicating, being out there. What does that technically look like? Well, technically, it looks like filing some a lot of paperwork, Mm -hmm. right? Because Mm -hmm. we are technically a nonprofit. You may have heard of a 501c3. That's the most standard nonprofit. Mm -hmm. We're actually a 501c6, which is a membership-based nonprofit. We do have a 501c3. That's our foundation that we started in 2020. But you have to file your paperwork um, with the Secretary of State, um, with uh, the federal government to get your EIN number, Mm -hmm. um, all of this type of paperwork. And wait until you get that back, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You can start and do your activities, but if you're a 501c3 and somebody gives you money, until you're granted 501c3 status, that's not a tax write-off for them, right? Mm-hmm. You're technically not a not a nonprofit, mm-hmm. so it really is, um, is it, uh, getting all of your your paperwork, doing all your filings, both locally at the state level and at the federal level, that are required. And uh, different states, uh, different municipalities require different types of paperwork. Uh, and then from there, it's literally up ramping, just like a startup business, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Getting, I mean, we went through logos. We had to figure out, you know, what 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 was our website going to be? What's the name of the organization going to be? Mm-hmm. Um, it's all a nice of website. Us, mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. We we put a lot of a mm-hmm. lot of work into it, <laughs> and um, and you know, I mean, what's our tagline going to be? Mm-hmm. How are we going to message what we're doing, right? And for a chamber, chambers are very events and program intensive. So then figuring out, and we were all volunteer at the time. What are we going to do? What events are we going to hold? Even for us, what does the membership structure look like? Mm -hmm. How much do people pay? Right, All of that we had to figure out. Now, we had the good fortune of our colleagues across the country. There's 53 or 54 LGBTQ chambers. At the time, there were were less. But we could look at them and see what are they doing, and particularly our colleagues in in North Texas Mm -hmm. to say, you know, what, is, what does this look like? And in a lot of ways, we mirrored what they were doing. Mm-hmm. We didn't have to start from scratch, nor does any chamber for that matter. I have there's one more technical thousands question. of chambers, thousands and thousands and thousands. Right. I had one more technical question, Chad. Um, you That was an interesting point. So un, until you are approved mm-hmm. as the 501C6 or mm-hmm. C3, whatever, you can't do any kind of tax stuff related to that 501c3, right. right? So, and this is going to be helpful for me. So let's say I want to start whatever C Corp, LLC, foundation, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, but I started in the middle of the year. Mm-hmm. So all of my profits or money before then have to be categorized differently or, or, or filed under a different tax system well so if how do you, i if can I, sorry can i carry over what i made into my new founded corporation yeah and now you're now you're getting into you know tax right, right. your accountant right so that you know but there are certain things if um so when i started my business right yeah uh, actually monday was was it my 12 year 10 year anniversary um 
Oh, uh, of cool. starting my business, mm-hmm. right? But imagine when I, I, so I used an attorney, an LGBTQ plus attorney, I might add, mm. um, to start my business. And uh, she filed all my LLC paperwork, everything that was required with the state. But I had expenses, right? Mm-hmm. Paying her. I didn't have a business account at the time, right? So all of that, I was able to categorize as startup expenses and, and things right. to get the business off the ground. Mm-hmm. So that got, that is part of my financials today. Right. Gotcha. It's the same with the chamber. We had startup expenses and things like that. Now, those were out of pocket for mm-hmm. Gary and myself that we eventually got reimbursed for. Mm-hmm. But um, but those were expenses that that we had incurred on on behalf of the organization. And that was filed under the the organization bracket or under your own the organization under the bracket. Organization. Okay, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. those were personal expenses that we incurred mm-hmm. on behalf of the organization. And we, um, and particularly early on, Gary, and, and, you know, think about we had to pay for um, our domain names, right? And right. all, uh, you know, GoDaddy, all that other stuff at the time. We know about it. Yeah. 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 There's a lot to do. And so, yeah. I mean, we're just trying to, and we were trying to do this in 90 days. Mm-hmm. So he's like, right. just pay for it, you know. Right. And we were just keeping, keeping receipts and things like that so mm-hmm. we could get, you know, get the organization off the ground. I uh, one question that I thought of last night, just again for understanding of how all this kind of stuff works. When you go to your website and you go to the corporate partnerships, mm-hmm. you have the Fertita Entertainment, mm-hmm. which owns, for people who don't know, the Rockets, Landry's, mm-hmm. Golden Nugget, etc. Is it? I'm I'm going to simplify this a lot just for my understanding, but if we need to go more complex, that's mm-hmm. fine too. Is it like? for Tita coming to the Chamber of Commerce saying, we will be a platinum partner. And what that means is we will donate this amount of money to you. Mm -hmm. And then the Chamber has all their members and they allocate that money that was given to them by Fertita to whatever is needed. So, um, so our corporate partners like our members. Um, so we have almost forty corporate partners, as you can see, and Fertita being our our top platinum uh, sponsor, and they've been with us for a number of years. So our corporate partners come to us for a variety of reasons. One, um, maybe it's brand visibility. In the case of uh, Fertita Entertainment, obviously, you know they they Landry's, et cetera, right? So they want to get more visibility with the LGBTQ plus community. Um, in some cases, they want to get their LGBTQ plus employees engaged in the community. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes they're looking to get more LGBT BE certified businesses engaged because a lot of the companies that you see on our list of corporate partners, they have a commitment to a diverse supply chain. And that means that they're going to do business with you know, women, people of color, uh, disabled owned businesses, LGBTQ owned businesses veteran-owned businesses, right? So they partner with us so we can get more LGBTQ-owned businesses connected because they've made a commitment to, to spend money through supply chain. So, and sometimes it's governmental relations. I mean, we're, right. we have a couple of corporate partners that we work with, particularly in, in Austin, because they're, um, you know, they're, they're very active um, in, in making sure that, you know, the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community is, Supported and when they're not taking a stand because it's also a business case, right? If this continued rhetoric and attacks on the LGBTQ plus community, it just that happens year after year. Companies go, I'm not moving to Texas. Um, employees, mm. maybe there's an opportunity to move here to work with their employer, and they're like, uh, No, I don't think I want to move to Texas. Mm. I don't feel like I'm going to be safe. My family's going to be safe. Mm-hmm. We're going to be welcomed, right? The, it's an economic case, and so. Um, so, you know, it makes sense for them to engage with us from that from that governmental affairs lens. So they'll they pay us that that you know their corporate partner membership, but we have their employees engaging with us through our LGBTQ plus workplace alliance, through our general events. Um, with Fertita, just you brought that example up. We uh, we took our first Friday, we have a first Friday meet and eat. We took that down to Kima. Uh, I think it was in June, early June. Mm. Um, had people drive down, just spend the afternoon. Uh, but we also do that with what we like to call our mom and moms and our pop and pops. Mm-hmm. Um, Harold's Restaurant in the Heights is, mm-hmm. you know, 
uh, LGBTQ owned. Urban Eats on Washington is LGBTQ owned. Mm-hmm. So we try to circulate those event- events, you know, to different restaurant members. But our corporate partners play a Im- very important role in uh, investing in our work and our mission. Do you ever get weary of corporate partners or maybe just partners in general doing this for the sake of looking good to other people? Yeah, and we've had some uh, companies that have reached out to us, and it's clear we we call that rainbow washing. Um, <laughs> rainbow washing. They just want to basically rainbow wash their logo and right. uh, and get their logo on our website. Mm-hmm. And um, so we, you know, uh, we have uh, deep conversations with them to understand what's what's their intention, what's their motive, why do you want to get involved, what's that going to look like, um, and uh, to to make sure that they're engaging for the right reasons. And there have been some in the past that um, it didn't feel like the right reasons. So mm-hmm. we suggested to them that the chamber was not a good avenue for them uh, in terms of engagement with the LGBTQ plus community. And that's kind of a big step for you guys in a way too, to say no to somebody yeah. because technically they're just offering you a sum of money right. to be a sponsor. And then, so that's pretty, that's pretty respectable if you would say no to certain yeah. people because it is money. But like you said earlier too, business is business and a mm-hmm. lot of these big corporations you know they're just going to do whatever it takes to get as much yeah. profit as possible and hopefully that you know hopefully they would have um a virtuous you know character yeah but when i look at somebody like amazon oops, sorry about that when i look at somebody like amazon mm-hmm. or I don't know, Chase Bank, another huge one, or we'll just keep it at those two for now. They're so in the business of making money that anything that they say regarding groups of people, Mm -hmm. whether it's race diversity or LGBTQ plus stuff or disability stuff, I think it's important. But then you go and actually look at their let's take Amazon for a very serious mm-hmm. example, their work conditions yeah, or, you know, the kind of work that they make people do. And I'm like, mm, it's not really adding up. Yeah. You know, and I don't, I don't, you know, Amazon, I don't think is on yours, right? They are not. No, not that it would be bad. I'm not saying it's a hundred percent. You know, it's, an, it, it, it's, 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 it's a good point. And these companies, they get so big. Right. And then it's, um, then there's, there's always going to be challenges inherent when you're, when you're an organization, and some of them, you know, multinational companies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so part of what we do is we look at the um, HRC, the Corporate Equality Index. Um, mm-hmm. Do they have policies um, that support LGBTQ plus workers? Is that is that visible? Um, are they engaged in the community? What does that look like? Um, but we've had uh, some companies in the past that did some things that we disagreed with, our community disagreed with, and we called them out. Um, mm. We had conversations with them and asked what they were going to do to, you know, fix the problem. Um, and sometimes we've been able to help them when they've had issues, right? Um, because sometimes it's a situation where something's happening, you know, within the company, the leadership doesn't know about it. So it's an interesting role for us to play. Um, but we're continually, we vet, you know, our corporate partners and make sure that they're in it. For the, for the right reasons. And, um, but I think companies are just going to have, you know, large companies like Amazon are going to have issues sometimes across the board. The question is, is when these issues come up, are they addressing them? Mm-hmm. And do you see internally all the pieces that uh, they're trying to do the right things, right? Mm-hmm. For us as a community, it's, you know, LGBTQ plus inclusive policies. It's community engagement. Do they um, uh, work to get more LGBTQ on businesses into their supply chain? Mm. Those pieces, those things. So, but, um, you, you know, you, you have to look at it as a whole. And we're continually talking to, to corporate partners to find out you know, what they're doing. Um, also, if they do something, you know, some of our corporate partners have been named uh, from HRC as best places to work, right, for LGBTQ plus mm-hmm. people. So those are the things that you have to figure out. Okay, what's the balance here? Are they headed in the right direction? Um, 
but inherent in just any companies. And, you know, it's just going to be challenges. Mm-hmm. When you say HRC, that's human relations. Human, human rights campaign. Human rights campaign. Mm-hmm. And you say the corporate equality index, mm-hmm. right? How, what, is, uh, what are the criteria or, yeah, the categories that they're looking at with an index like that? There's a lot of categories. It's an extensive um, survey that they have to fill out yeah. every year. Um, it's, it's, it's quite coveted by, you know, a lot of companies to be rated 100% mm-hmm. right. on the corporate equality index. Uh, but it's everything from LGBTQ inclusive policies, uh, how they are engaging, uh, the supply chain piece, mm-hmm. right? And it gets very specific into, you know, uh, tra- and transgender and uh, tra- transgender nonconforming, gender expansive benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, do you have, uh, you know, do your benefits cover, you know, a surgery for transgender people, right? Gender change surgery. Um, so different things like that. It's quite an extensive survey that uh, HRC has culled over the years, and they're continually updating it, right? Um, to make sure that it meets current times, but also if something comes up to make sure that companies are addressing it on behalf of the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah. Is HRC a uh, public or private body? It's a nonprofit. Nonprofit. Yeah. So they have a a 501c3 foundation. Mm -hmm. They have a C4 Mm -hmm. organization. Um, and they have a PAC as well, which actually endorses uh, pro equality candidates. Wow. Yeah. And they're do, out of DC. So, do you know the name of the PAC by any chance? Uh, I just think, I think it's the uh, Human Rights Campaign yeah. uh, Political Action Committee. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, they're kind of yeah. like the flagship of e- LGBTQ equality yeah i mean they have done branding their gripes about for decades and i've even heard gripes from my mom and their circles about you know how they do their stuff sometimes too Mm -hmm. obviously she's still it's very in support but uh, But again a big organization right so you're not immune to Mm -hmm. and they um they they have led the charge on uh, uh in congress around the equality act Mm -hmm. which is pivotal right right to ensure that lgbtq people uh, it receive you know have uh, are treated equity equitably and fairly uh, when it comes to you know laws and you know federal policy right mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and kind of on that note I would love to get into like a really nitty gritty question mm-hmm. you know obviously this is very talked about in our culture right now as it's coming up more and more you talked about the transgender. Mm-hmm rights and the healthcare and does this company cover surgery or something mm-hmm. like something along those lines gender reassignment mm-hmm. gender reassignment surgery firstly and i haven't really i haven't done a deep thought about any company's healthcare so much but do you think that all companies should say if you want to reassign your gender we should cover it yes absolutely yes i think i, I mean uh you need to uh, offer when it comes to employees' health care needs and not limit um, what health care options are out there. So, and uh, healthy employees, whether mentally or physically, mm-hmm. right, make, make for, for better employees. Mm-hmm. And if a person mm-hmm. feels, feels the need, they feel like they want to have gender reassignment surgery, then they should be allowed to do that, and that should be covered by insurance. Um, and you see, you know, a, a lot of companies now, this used to be more of the exception than the norm. Mm-hmm. And now it's very much more of the norm, right? As, as companies have tried to move to be uh, very much inclusive and transgender, you know, supportive of the transgender community. Mm-hmm. So are there any, what would be an example of something that uh, a company shouldn't cover? Maybe surgery, like would a, would Mm, silly you know, example, but would breast implants? Yeah, I mean, that's for like, and I don't know. Some companies make, I don't know how that work. You know, that's an HR um, kind of healthcare insurance question. Mm-hmm. Um, not, not my specific background, but, um, but, you know, companies are moving, companies have added everything from pet insurance these days, right? Mm. Because in order to, uh, to attract uh, an inclusive, uh, diverse workforce, um, you, you have to, these are the things that people want and need, 
mm-hmm. to to function in their lives, to be their whole and authentic selves. So it makes good sense for companies um, to do this. And when you have a large company that can put the weight of, you know, thousands of employees behind an insurance plan, well, they can negotiate really good rates with insurance carriers and, and offer unique perks, if you will, you know, like pet insurance. If I'd had that when I was in corporate America, wow, that would have been, I mean, right. you guys know, I mean, that, that's, that's a nice perk, right? Yeah. So um, I think companies need to be doing everything they can to uh, attract workers and then address. There's a lot of work being done to make sure that employees have access, access to mental health resources. Mm-hmm. We know that's a huge challenge um, across the board in our society yeah. today. Uh, that's something when I was in corporate America, you didn't hear anything about that. Yeah. It was very, you might have, have what was called an employee assistance program at the time, um, but you didn't tell anybody you were calling the 1 800 number. Right. You know, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think it, um, I think companies that are very um, uh, progressive on this front are going to be the ones that at- attract the best and brightest talent. Yeah, I really think that in general, companies if you're working you know 40 hours for somebody whoever it is i think you should get some form of health care yeah i understand you know if it doesn't cover every single everything Mm -hmm. uh a funny example might be i could understand if a company said we're going to give you all this health care but we're not going to cover your uh medical marijuana yeah, just because. And I think that probably you know does happen, and depending on state and. But then I would be like, that doesn't seem fair when we know that pharmaceuticals kill people all the time. Well, and you just pointed out, you say that's not fair, right? And that's what happens. Employees inside of companies advocate, and they say, right. maybe me- they need medical marijuana because it's been approved, or they need it for their child, or you know, right. That's how you know internal policies, internal insurance plans change, mm-hmm. right? Because. Because there's a need. And I also understand that as a company owner, and maybe you kind of understand this too, it probably is very stressful monetarily to make sure everybody's accounted for. Yeah. And I think that's when the government, I don't want my government to be too big, Mm -hmm. you know, like making us marionettes. Mm -hmm. But at that point, what I'm talking about, I think it would be good for the government to say, okay, we do have the money to... Like, I don't have health insurance right now. Yeah. And I work all the time, Mm -hmm. but it's not for a specific thing. It's not under a company name. And I would rather not pay over 100 a month right now. Let me tell you about Legacy Community Health. They're Uh one of our uh, nonprofit members. Long time, well respected. They're what's called a federally qualified healthcare center, mm-hmm. and um, they can help you if you're underinsured or uninsured. Yeah. So, and um, I highly recommend to to reach out. They're really okay. great, and they're mm-hmm. it's healthcare, eye care, dental, all of that. Good. And yeah. another question that I wanted to do because I I did want to ask some like the hot button issues mm-hmm. to you especially because of your perspective. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was saying earlier. We need that We need that perspective. Mm-hmm. When it comes to the transgender issue of transgender athletes mm-hmm. performing against biological sex athletes, however you want to put it, what is your opinion on that? Well, I think, you know, transgender kids should be able to compete based on how they identify. Mm-hmm. Um, now you're it, specific when you said transgender kids. Yeah, well, transgender kids, transgender adults, anybody that identifies as transgender, I think they should be able to compete based on you know the gender that they identify with. Um, sure. And you know, it's society creates these constructs of you know what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. And um, it's when we can break those kind of constructs, like only you know uh, that that you know for me, right? I was supposed to grow up. I was supposed to uh, marry a man, right? And have two kids and do all that, right? So I've had to break that construct. And I think when we we try to box people in Mm -hmm. to, you know, specific constructs, whether it's around sports or other things, it only hurts us, right? It lets let's allow people, if they identify by a specific gender, um, 
and that's exactly how they identify and, and how they interact in the world, then I think we should let people do that. Um, and I, I'm actually all for this. I just feel like I have, when I think about it, I have caveats to it. Because mm-hmm. I'm, by the way, I want everybody to be included and I don't want to ever put anybody down. Mm-hmm. So another thing that I learned recently is that after the Leah Thomas swimming, that era, mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, I guess that the swim association Mm -hmm. said we're not allowing transgender athletes to compete unless they started transitioning at or before the age of 12, Mm -hmm. because that's when they see that it will have the most hormonal impact along with the body. And my thought is that preface again, I do not want anybody to be hurt. Mm -hmm. Like, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. Um, but sometimes I've seen Leah Thomas is, is, is an example. Mm-hmm. She obviously beat them by a lot. But then another sport like MMA, mm-hmm. where you have a transgender woman fighting a biological woman. And typically it does not go well for the biological woman. Mm-hmm. And I have, to, I have to concede the point, okay, It is, there is more bone density, muscle mass, testosterone, Mm -hmm. et cetera. And then I think, is that truly fair to the biological women? What is your thought on that? Because it's a touchy subject. As someone who grew grew up playing sports, I mean, I grew up playing, you know, softball, volleyball, all of that. Yeah. And um, for me, I wouldn't have personally, you know, had an issue. I think whatever it is, whoever you're competing against causes you to, you know, to to raise your level of competition. So um, that certainly, you know, is an argument that uh, different people have have used. Um, But at the end of the day, I don't think we should, uh, for for sake of making one group of people feel okay and that they can compete, you know, not include or exclude um, a certain group of people who identify, you know, I mean, so if this person wants to play the sport or, and they identify as a female and, and they're passionate about playing whatever that type of sport is, are you going to have them play with men if that's not where they're comfortable, right? If that's not how they identify. So I think it's a slippery slope. And this is um, honestly, I think, a, an issue that, uh, that certain groups are, are using, you know, to, to hurt the LGBTQ plus community really underlying raise money for their causes Mm -hmm. because they're, they're, you know, they're losing in legislatures across the country when it comes to uh, LGBTQ plus legislation. Um, But in the meantime, until they lose, they win a lot of these arguments, if you will, from people that just don't understand. And that hurts the LGBTQ plus community that hurts LGBTQ plus kids, Mm -hmm. particularly trans kids. And, um, and simply because these kids, these kids or even adults don't conform to exactly how we think. Mm-hmm. And the way we think is typically the way we've been raised with this construct, right? right. Whether it's male or female, right? Recognizing that there's, you know, n- it, people fall in various parts of the spectrum. And for me, it's like if we can just learn to say, it's okay, that makes for a better world. And when people can, again, bring their full and authentic selves to the table, however they identify, whether it's their sexual orientation, their gender gender identity, gender expression, that's a good thing for, you know, it's a good thing for our world. It's a good thing for our country. Um, it's it's just a much better world. It's a world I want to live in. Right. Yeah. I'm. I really am all about everybody being accepted because mm-hmm. I don't care if you're this, that, and the other. I will, I will treat you with respect yep. for who you are, as long as you know you treat me with respect and you're a good person too, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, I only brought up the sports thing just because there aren't too many issues where that biological difference matters mm-hmm. so much. The sports is one of them. Yeah. Uh, and again, and I, I only bring it up because it's kind of a cultural, and, it, and it's certainly getting a lot of a lot of attention. I mean, it dominated the state legislature. But for anybody who thinks ago. that that's a reason to look down upon a certain group, I don't think that's a, a good thing. Right. You know? And I, I definitely would encourage anybody listening to go and, um, 
you know, there's great organizations, trans-led organizations, both in Houston, in the state, and across the country um, that are, are, are have and are working on this issue and to really, really understand um, some of the, the really more background information, the details around this, different the different positions. Don't just accept it at face value, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and those trans-led organizations are making sure that they're, they're seen, their voices are heard and they're seen in legislatures across the country when this type of legislation is coming up. I'm sorry to talk so much. No, I was just wondering, what would it look like if I were trying to sign up as a, you said arts plus? Business. Is that a thing? Mm-hmm. Arts plus business? Mm-hmm. What does that look like, that process? Well, typically, uh, for any of our members uh, that are 99 employees or under, you can join the chamber. And so then if you fall under the arts plus uh, business category, um, sometimes that's, you know, a lot of the museums and things like that. Mm. Um, uh, But, you know, we have willing to cultivate relationships where it makes sense from that arts plus business lens. Mm -hmm. Uh, So really, it's just a matter of joining the chamber, first of all, to, to get started. And, you know, I was asking you guys what type of music you played, et cetera, because we really do when we put on events. So we just had an event last week, our happy hour. We held that at one of our member businesses that's, in this case, located in the Galleria. The caterer that we used for the food was one of our member businesses. Cool. Right? Mm -hmm. So that is always our goal, unless it's just something we can't find Mm -hmm. within our member, you know, member base, we'll go outside of that. To, to get you know get the service or the product mm-hmm. um, a lot of our um, and I meant, meant to bring you guys some some of the chamber Chotskys, you know branded stuff mm-hmm. uh, one of our great members promo print supplies those for mm-hmm. us typically and um, so that's that's our goal as well not to just you know have members doing business with each other or sometimes corporate partners um, but also making sure that we're buying right mm-hmm. yeah and supporting supporting our members every time we've, we've had a lot of people reach out to us and they're like, we'd love to host an event for you. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but you're not a member of the chamber. Mm, um, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and so please join the chamber. If you're investing in us, then we're going to try to, you know, invest in you where, where it makes sense. Mm-hmm. When you have a business or a member in the chamber mm-hmm. that is on a higher level, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know how many levels there are, but mm-hmm. you know, upper level member, how do they get to that position? Well, typically, so we have d- different membership tiers. Mm-hmm. So our Business Connect level is our, uh, the um, that's for five employees or under. Okay. Right. And then, you know, depending on how many employees. Oh, okay. So, so, and then our corporate partners are 100 employees or more. So we don't think that companies that have 100 more employees should be able to pay the same rate. As a company that has one employee, right? Right. It's just yeah. not fair. Totally. Yeah. So we do this tiered tiered type of system. So typically it's based on that employee base. Now, some of them will just pay the higher rate regardless because um, the higher you go, the more visibility you get. So our president circle level is our highest business level mm-hmm. membership. And um, those that uh, invest at that level are shown on the bottom of our emails as, gotcha. a, as our president circle members. Right. And, and uh, uh, along with some other different logos, like our strategic partners, the U.S. Small Business Administration is one of our strategic partners. Lift Fund is another one, the City of Houston Office of Business Opportunities. So, you know, different ways that we we highlight highlight businesses. Every new member, though, coming on gets a new member highlight, mm-hmm. um, gets recognized. Members also have an opportunity to sponsor events. Some of our businesses, I mean, they want to sponsor and be able to give, uh, you know, maybe a five, ten minute spiel about what their business does mm-hmm. um, to, to the membership. And so they'll sponsor an event. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, of course, that helps us all, at the end of the day underwrite the cost for the food. Right. Does the chamber sometimes say this bit, we want to support this specific business right here? Let's say it's a business with mm-hmm. uh, five employees or ten mm-hmm. employees. We really like you a lot. You're doing great work. We want to support you. Here's a check for ten thousand dollars to help your business. Does that happen like so that? We so yes and no. I mean, uh, so we partnered with the Grubhub and mm-hmm. the National LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce earlier this year, 
And we did give out $70,000 in grants to LGBTQ and allied-owned restaurants. And we had uh, seven businesses. Uh, five of them got $10,000 each. Oh, that's nice. And the other two got 5000 To kind of do with what they need. Whatever they wanted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, were those in Houston? Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you name some of them? Uh Let's shout see. Out, Sweet, shout out. Sweet Times was uh, one of them. It's a wonderful little bakery out off of West Chase. Okay. Um, City Cellars, that's in the Museum District, is another one. Harold's in the Heights Harold's, yeah. is another one. Uh, Buddy's, which is in Montrose, it's a bar and restaurant. I'm trying to think of what, where Buddy's is. It's right off of Fairview. Uh, right off of Fairview, kind of near La Mejicana. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so they got $10,000. And this was all, you know, when we when we pushed it out, they applied. Mm-hmm. And then there was a review process at the national level. Mm-hmm. Okay, we weren't involved so in that because we knew the businesses, right? Application process. Yeah. And they didn't the even grant. have to be a member of the business. If they weren't a member when they applied and if they got the grant, then they also got a, uh, a membership with the chamber as well. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, Do you see, are there any specific groups or people in Houston that are making the biggest impact besides the chamber, aside from the chamber? Well, I would say all all of the diverse chamber colleagues, you know, they're doing great work. I often say we're boots on the ground. So we're really boots on the ground working with our communities helping to connect um, our members, literally. Um, I mean, we're active 12 months out of the year. Mm-hmm. I think by the time we end this year, we will have had between uh, the events we hold, collaboration events and things like that, close to 80 events, give or take. Wow. Yeah. Including, you know, those like pride nights with Houston Rockets and right. Houston Astros and things like that, that are very much about community and being seen and uh, having fun. And those sports teams, you know, celebrating our community. So, um, I have an idea. Yeah. (laughs) Business networking music festival presented by the Houston ensemble for you guys. Well, we've talked about, you know, as, so we're still, you know, a new organization, but what kind of public facing events do we want to start doing in the future? Mm -hmm. Uh, we're, we're doing some, but more where it is, you know, is it a is it a is it a pride market right where mm-hmm. the businesses can come and you know sell product yeah. uh, music festival one of our so we have a handful of uh, nonprofit members and one of them is the uh, normal anomaly initiative and normal anomaly initiative okay mm-hmm. and they work specifically with the black uh, queer uh, tra- and trans community and they did their first ever music festival. Oh, cool. Like last year. So nice. so there's a, there's where opportunities could be to collaborate and say, hey, what are y'all doing? And this mm-hmm. is what, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, because, again, they're just trying to lift up, you know, um, mm-hmm. LGBTQ plus musicians, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, musicians that are just trying to make their way in this world and create and connect community across that for their music festival. So they did that, I want to say, about four months ago. It's mm-hmm. their first one, I believe. So, yeah. What is the vision for 23? Mm. Well, we were mapping out um, all our plans. We've got a lot of uh, events that we want to do. Some more I want to do and just wishing we had the bandwidth. We're also rolling out some broader economic inclusion work for the community that are it's just not business specific. So think about career workforce development training for people that, um, you know, need resume building, need to know how to put together, you know, uh, know, know how to interview, right? Mm-hmm. All that kind of workforce development piece. We want to help create uh, support for uh, on, for just individuals in the community so they can then be successful, right? Also connect them to inclusive job opportunities with those 40 corporate partners. Uh, the community, unfortunately, is so far behind when it comes to, you know, uh, economic opportunity. I mean, there's a huge depth because we have been disconnected from families of origin. We haven't been able to pass down what some would get, say, a a business passed down from generation to generation. Uh, We haven't gotten maybe wealth, right? Inheritance, things like that passed down because 
Many of us were kicked out of our homes when we identified, right? So the uh, economic impact for the community is, is pretty severe. And even when you consider, you know, people of color in the trans community, it's, you know, it's like five tenfold for the challenges that they experience when it comes to, you know, uh, economic opportunity and really economic insecurity. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be rolling out broader work to help address those gaps that exist um, in Houston and the region. Sweet. Yeah. Because we want to help people get, you know, uh, get access at the end of the day, we want a, an inclusive economy in Houston. Mm-hmm. And in order to achieve that, you've got to have the LGBTQ plus community not only represented, but you have to see the, uh, the LGBTQ com- community has to be succeeding mm-hmm. and thriving. This is a little bit of a jump back question, but you just mentioned kind of the importance of family. Mm-hmm. And I just um, remembered that I wanted to ask you earlier, did your upbringing slash family have a, AKA your parents or grandparents or guardians Mm -hmm. or whoever have a direct impact on how you went about your life in this context, LGBTQ context? Well, my um, mom wasn't overly accepting at first. I had a sister that was fairly, you know, she just, whatever. She didn't, she didn't care. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, she's passed away now, but, um, but you know, when I, when I came out again, some would consider later in life, considering a lot of kids come out much earlier these days. But um, I was 25. So um, my dad wasn't around a lot. He was kind of in and out of our lives. Mm. He did not approve mm-hmm. of uh, me being a lesbian by by any means. And it's just something that we more or less didn't talk about. Um, so, so they, you know, they did have influence. I would say some some good and some some bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, parents don't always get it right. And uh, my my dad, I often say about him, he was never the, uh, he certainly wasn't the perfect father. He was most of the time the absent father. Mm. But, um, but there were things that, you know, I get from him and I take from him. And, I, you know, I, I value and appreciate that. And that's just who, you know, who was put in my life to be, to be my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same with my mom. My mom was a single parent. So what I really, really get from her, she worked her ass off mm-hmm. she, every day to put food on our table. Um, and she struggled a lot, yeah. a lot of struggle when we were growing up. So, But that sense of her figuring out always how to make a way, finding uh, she was very uh, resourceful mm-hmm. to try to figure out how to make ends meet. And um, I definitely get that resourcefulness from her, without, without a doubt. Because I'm the kind of person, if I if I see a wall in front of me, I'm going to figure out how to go, you know. Break it down. Yeah. Well, yeah. break it down. I'm going to go over it. I'm going to go around it. Right. I'm going to go under it if under I have it. to. I will <laughs> figure out a way. Yeah. And, um, and I think part of that comes from just seeing her do that for her two kids. Um, because, I mean, she had to. Would you call yourself religious or spiritual? Spiritual, definitely not religious, but very much spiritual. So not aligning with a named religion, no. but spiritual in the sense of maybe feeling that there is a higher power. Oh yeah, definitely yeah. believe there's a higher power. Yeah, and um, I, I, you know, years ago when I, I had to reconcile when I split myself off from the church because that was really the largest part of my identity at the time. And I really had to, to realize that just because I don't go into a building with four walls, it doesn't mean that I can't be spiritual and be connected. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I struggled for a while then of, do I need to find a religion to be involved in? And then where I finally, and where I finally am today is the work that I do on behalf of the community. And um, the, I, you know, I, I work sometimes seven days a week, right? And I do this out of my passion and love for the community and to help the community achieve some things that we should have, right? Equal rights, um, making sure we have respect and dignity. So that is, that's the way I give back. That's the way I give back spiritually, right? To the world and how I put out um, what I think is most important to me and uh, give back all the good that's been given to me. And, if I said to you, do you love all people? Mm-hmm. What is your answer? Uh, yeah. 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 Do I respect all people? No. 
but yeah, I feel like that is a different that is a different mm-hmm. question because not everybody. I think respect has to be earned. Yeah. Um, the reason I asked you, do you love all people? One, I feel like I can feel from you that mm-hmm. you probably do, which is really nice. When we had a Satanist mm-hmm. on the show, uh, you know, I don't, I don't identify as a specific religion. I was mm-hmm. brought up Catholic. Christian, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So I'm totally aware of all that, but I would say the same thing yep. as you. Yep. But there is a tinge with this thing of Satanism. There's like a little bit of a darkness to it. Mm-hmm. And I said this to her, I said, do you love all people? And she said, no. And I said, okay. Mm, then she says, I can hate uh, an mf if I want to. Mm-hmm. Or I saw a woman walking the other day He was wearing a shirt with an upside down cross that says, Jesus loves you, so I don't have to. Mm. And I just don't know if that's the right way to go about life. I'm not saying I have the answer on it. Right. But, you know, there's a different energy with somebody like you where you're warm and then you say, yeah, I do love all people. Might have different opinions, might have a respect thing. But this thing of hate doesn't really uh, work. I think we can see that with what's happening in the country and the world today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, yeah. uh, I mean, if there, if there were, were more love and understanding, um, you know, whether you call it God, the universe, whatever, you know, whatever you refer to it, um, more love, mm-hmm. I think, is, is absolutely key. Mm-hmm. And, um, and more vulnerability, too. Brene Brown talks a lot about that. Mm. And I think about that from time to time. And when we can be stripped back and be our most vulnerable— because when we can be our most vulnerable, we make the most authentic of connections. Mm-hmm. But the only way we can be vulnerable is when we can love, right? Yeah. And, and that takes a lot. And some people haven't been loved. They've n- never felt love for the most part uh, in, in a lot of their life. And and it takes them on a path that maybe, you know, a, a bad path, quite frankly, you know, based on where they wound up in society. Or mm-hmm. it takes them on a path where they love even more. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, I think, you know, even years ago, I sat down with someone in our community and they asked me, because we had lost, uh, it was Hero, when the big Hero ordinance, I don't know if you guys were here or not, but mm-hmm. we had a big ordinance on the Battle of the Hegel, Houston Equal Rights Alliance ordinance. And we, mm-hmm. and we lost, you know, people in the city voted, voted against us to have an equal rights, uh, you know, ordinance. For the city, and um, and you know this person was so distraught, and I was too. I mean, it's upset when people vote against you know your rights to be a human being. It hurts, right? Mm-hmm. But I said, what we have to do is we have to continue to do the work to love, to outreach, to connect, mm-hmm. and uh, that gets harder and harder these days. But it goes to, back to a point that you you made earlier is. We just have to walk through the door as our authentic self. Some people are going to like us. Some people are going to love us. Mm-hmm. But every day we have to, you know, work in, in our work through our authentic and true selves. And for me, that's operating from a pace of love, um, caring, and compassion, um, and doing everything I can to help a community that's been marginalized and disenfranchised. Um, yeah. Because you know what, uh, our community not only deserves that. But it's it's the right thing to do, um, and it's it's something that we need to respect with more communities. Who actually, if we could just lift up communities instead of tearing them down, mm-hmm. that's the world we need to live in. Yeah, you know, the irony, of, yeah. well, just like you said, it's like if someone says, well, "No, I can hate somebody if I want." The irony is that to get them to love, you just got to kill that with kindness. Yes, I agree. So it's like. They might be even making it hard for you because now right. they're talking about hating stuff. And you're like, oh, whoa. But you make it their issue, not yours. But you, yeah, yeah, yeah. But exactly. So you got to, you just got to shower them or something. Yeah. And I'm yeah. just personally not up by that word hate. It's just, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a terrible world. But yeah. there's a lot of it, um, you know, and some of it just gets passed down from generation to generation mm-hmm. to generation. Right. And, you know, another thing, <laughs> I just think that, a lot of the hate, even that we see, we see it on television. I'm not mm-hmm. saying it doesn't exist, but we see it on television. We see it on social media. We see it between people on social yeah. media. But then when you actually get into a room with pers- with a person 
maybe you have different opinions. I think both people typically recognize each other's humanity. And there's a, oh, you know what? Maybe we can talk. Mm -hmm. And I always like to say this quick story. When a homeless guy stole my electric bass after a gig, (laughs) I was distraught. My moneymaker. And we went and found him. And, you know, I had in my head, I was like, I'm going to be like, give me my bass. Right. Something right. like that. But when I got there, I was I was like, I could never do that. Yeah. Could never hurt him or shake him up or anything. One, because that doesn't feel right to me. Two, he's so much more down and out than me that it's not worth it. Yeah. And three, I'm recognizing his humanity once I get there. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a... It's important for the people to come together. Yeah. And there's Maybe. more of us down here than at the very top. Yeah. And I think we need to trust in ourselves together more than we need to trust in the, the top, top. We need mm. more Chads in the world. <laughs> Wouldn't did. you agree that there's <laughs> more vitriol somehow like on online than really like. Yeah. Social media has created. You a, know. It's bad. Yeah, it's 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 created an opportunity for people to hide behind the screen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I personally don't get into it. Like, for example, on social media, it's just not worth it. I'm not going to one use my energy that way. Right. Right. Um, right. I'm likely not going to change the person's mind. Right. But um, people that are unhappy, likely not experiencing a lot of love in their lives. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, they use it as a, as an outlet for all this anger. I think, and um, it's social media is just easy. A yeah, that's what, and a keyboard, right? It yeah. worries me, you know, it worries me with things like metaverse. Mm-hmm. It's like, seems really cool. But then like those people, like you said, that don't have love. Yeah. They're just going to go way deep, like deeper than ever before. Right. In there. Yep. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure about it. Yeah. But that's maybe another topic for the, another day. Yeah, yeah. Social media. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Tammy, I was going to say we've gone for a solid hour and a half. Yeah. Don't want to take up too much of your day. Is there a final message? Yeah. Anything you want to say before um, we end? Well, I would just say, you know, uh, at, at the chamber, you know, we're uh, here to support, whether it's LGBTQ plus owned businesses, um, just professionals, allies, people that want to support the community. I often say about the chamber, we're at the intersection of business and community. So that's a unique position for us mm. to be. Mm-hmm. But it truly is great networking, a great way to, to create connection and so we invite people to come out, you know, check us out. Um, we certainly would love to get more LGBTQ owned and allied owned businesses as part of the chamber and reflected in our public directory. And if you are an LGBTQ plus owned business, we'd love to talk to you about, uh, you know, how to get LGBT BE certified. Because if you're a member of our chamber, then your certification fee is waived. Mm. So there's a great win-win with that as, as well. And, um, and just to say thank you both for the opportunity to, to share more. It's been a great conversation. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you for coming. Everybody, this has been Tammy Wallace, President, CEO, Co-Founder of the Houston, and more, of the Houston LGBTQ Plus Chamber of Commerce. We're going to put all their info in the description. Obviously, you can click on it, check them out, and um, follow them, see what they're up to, and get involved. And Tammy, yeah, thank share you so this much. conversation. Share the conversation. Big thanks to that, Tammy. We got to share these conversations because that's the only way we're going to have any sort of improvement in our world, as we talked about, just being open and loving. And we'll see you guys on the next one. <laughs>